Hi, my name is Mona Susan Power, and I am a fiction writer, and I'm a Yankton Dakota, enrolled on the Standing Rock Sioux uh, Reservation, but I was born and raised in the city of Chicago. And I'm going to be reading an excerpt today from the new novel I just finished writing. It's called A Council of Dolls, and it tells the story of three different uh, generations of girls um, who are from Standing Rock. One era is the 1960s, one is from the era of the 1930s, and one from the early 1900s. So today you'll hear the voice of Lillian, who's growing up during the 1930s, and she and her sister Blanche are in a, an Indian boarding school in Bismarck, North Dakota. So, Blanche warns me that my nemesis is out for blood. Well, what she actually says is, you better be careful. Sister Frances is looking for any excuse to take you down. I already know. When I won the statewide spelling bee this week up against adults from all over North Dakota, you'd think from the nun's face that I'd just taken the Lord's name in vain while shooting up the room. She acts like I'm a gangster, the hidden Dakota stepdaughter of babyface Nelson. Sister Frances should be happy that my winning word was canonical and not something embarrassing like scatological or gynecology. She'd probably faint if she even heard a term like that. According to her, we're not supposed to have bodies all riddled with sin, but turn ourselves into holy spirits that rise above life and blood and childbirth. The problem is her holy spirit might be starved clean of every physical comfort or desire, but it's just plain mean as a rattlesnake. No, worse. As Blanche says, she is pure hell. The other teachers at school are proud of me, like I won because they do such a good job with backward Indian kids, turning us from hoodlum savages into respectable citizens. As a result of my win, I'm given special privileges to borrow a book from our small library, to take it with me instead of having to skim it right there in the few minutes of free time between chores and classes. Sister Frances catches me mooning over a new box of books donated to the school. I'm clutching a thick hardcover novel to my chest, A Girl of the Limber Lost, which looks like heaven compared to the dreary titles on most of the shelves. Sister Frances points her long finger at me. Something Ina taught us is severely rude. That is theft, she cries. Those books haven't been cataloged yet. How dare you touch them? She snatches the wonderful book from me and glances at the title page. It's gloriously illustrated with flowers and butterflies that look as if they could fly off the paper and swarm her face. The very existence of such a book is no doubt an abomination in her eyes. You are no better than a criminal, she says. The charge makes me gasp, though I could kick myself for not exerting more self-control. I understand, Sister Frances, I know her language. This isn't personal, which makes it worse. The only reason she singles me out is because of my magic when it comes to words, the way they're never mysterious to me, and always friends, how my ability to learn them, to weave them together, puts the lie to her beliefs and prejudices. If she could stamp me out, she would. I stain her world. Sister Frances has strong fingers that can grip the back of the neck like metal pliers. She nabs me like this and escorts me to the basement where she tosses me into her favorite room, the dark punishment box that makes you feel like you're dead and buried and the rest of the world is gone. I know I've seen the last of the limber lost, the last of the beautiful ink butterflies and any stories they carry on their bright wings. The nun will no doubt tear the book to pieces and feed it to the kitchen stove. And I'm skipping to the end of uh, this chapter. And um, I forgot to mention that uh, this character Lillian has a doll um, that was given to her by mission ladies. It's a Shirley Temple doll, but she calls her May after May West. And um, May's actual physical body has been buried with another little girl who was dying. And so the doll was given to her, but in spirit, she comes back when um, Lillian is locked up in the punishment box. So May is, is her Shirley Temple doll. No one else can see her now. Only, only Lillian. Um, Blanche doesn't launch her rebellion right away. 
I don't even think it's planned. Maybe her meek act was intended to buy time until, until she could design the perfect revenge. This is revenge against a priest who is speaking ill of Sitting Bull. But instead of her brain cooking up grand schemes, something in her snaps while we're doing our kitchen chores. Blanche scrubs the floor while I peel potatoes. May is napping curled around my ankles like a cat. She hums a peppy tune in her sleep that doesn't match the mood of the room. Maybe Blanche catches some wisp of music in the heavy air. Now she's humming too as she scrubs, though not the same song as May. She's on her hands and knees, wielding the brush with so much force, I think she might plunge it through the planks. She scrubs in rhythm to her song, her upward push, the downbeat of a drum. Oh no, my heart may or may not still bear an open hole, but right now it's feeling solid as rock, a petrified thing, frozen with fear. I recognize my sister's quiet tune, a song our Ina taught us, which honors Sitting Bull, our Lala. Blanche's hum streams quietly from her nose through several rounds of the song. I know better than to, do, to say anything. When she's mad, she can be perverse and do the opposite of what she's told. I remind myself to breathe, to keep breathing for all of us. My knife slips on the potato and I'm lucky I don't cut myself. Be careful, I say to myself, to my sister under my breath. I don't know how much time passes. Whenever I'm most afraid, time slides right off the clock and becomes something else, a slow oozing paste that makes each moment work to unstick itself. How many minutes pass before Blanche adds words to her song, Dakota words that tell the story of Lala and his courageous heart. How many minutes before her song gets louder, the scrub brush pounding the floor in accompaniment? I finally unlock myself and force my legs to stand. Blanche, stop, I cry. May wakes and grabs my, my leg tight as if she too is scared. Blanche doesn't hear me. Her anger has torched all sense of fear. Or maybe it's devotion that fills her now, so there's no room for anything else. She's like a girl martyr who can't feel the first lick of an executioner's flames because she's wild with spirit. Maybe Blanche isn't here in this kitchen, but walking with Lala beside the Grand River, flowing with it and matching its sweet song with their steps. Soon, Blanche is loud enough to bring nuns on the run, skirts flying, some clutching the long crucifix they wear so it won't bounce obscenely against their bodies. I find myself standing over my sister. I grab her scrub brush, but her grip is too tight. I let go. I hear myself beg her to stop, to be quiet, as if it's someone else who pleads. I kick over Blanche's bucket to get her attention, but she doesn't seem to notice. Sister Anne is the first to reach Blanche. She's the gentlest of this order of nuns. She's crying like me, like she can't bear to see this girl throw her life away. When Blanche sings louder, Sister Anne tries to stuff a dish towel in her mouth, but Blanche is too quick. She's on her feet, dashing past. She can sing and race around the room at the same time. She leaps onto a chair and from the chair onto the massive kitchen table, she kicks the potatoes I was peeling onto the floor. She breaks so many rules at once, beginning with the use of our language. I'm ready to faint. This feels a bit like the end of the world. Some part of me says that's crazy. Why should a girl singing in a kitchen be the end of the world? Or did May say that? She looks at me like I'm expected to answer. Nuns pile on top of my sister and I can't see her anymore. Sometimes her song is muffled, but she must be biting the sister's hands because the song always breaks through again, defiant as any warrior's battle cry. I'm shaking so hard I can barely stand. And it's May who comes to my rescue. She can't seem to do anything to help Blanche, but is determined to keep me safe. She raises her hand in the air and waves it at me. I reach down and as soon as we clasp hands, the magic takes over. May and I become weightless beings who can float on air. We rise up, up passing the table and the massive stove higher than the windows, so high our heads gently bump the ceiling and we rest against it like carnival balloons. 
We have a bird's eye view of the skirmish. My sister is covered with nuns, the way ants swarm a beetle trapped on its back or crows peck apart a downed squirrel. I can't tell if she's singing because there's a roar in my ears as if the Grand River has flooded its banks and is about to smash through the kitchen. My emotions are flat in this weightless space and can't upset me. All I can do is watch. Sister Frances is trying to thrust soap in Blanche's mouth, her homemade industrial soap that can burn for days, but Blanche is thra a thrashing buffalo spirit no one can subdue. The nun points, commands, Sister Bernard is heating water in a cauldron. Not too hot, Sister Frances must order since it doesn't take long. She bends over the cauldron, working the soap with her hands in the heated water. What is she doing, I wonder? May works out the puzzle ahead of me. Soap, soup, she chirps, like what's happening is a game. It turns out Sister Frances's, is a Sister Frances's imagination is every bit as large and diabolical as my own. She gets soap in Blanche's mouth by pouring it in, one ladle of the melted stuff after the other. And even though I'm held by magic that soothes the edges of panic, I can't help hollering down to the cluster of nuns that they'd better stop or they'll drown my Blanche. Hours later, when May has brought us down from the ceiling and allowed the sisters to lead me to bed, she tells me what happened, how Sister Frances poisoned Blanche with lye from strong soap, how Sister Anne held the girl and wept, but couldn't save her after hours of vomiting blood, how the doctor arrived too late and wrote down whatever Sister Francis told him to write on the death certificate because it was the middle of the night and he wanted to return to sleep. How Sister Francis told the other nuns what happened was a tragic accident, but no doubt a censure from the Lord brought down on Blanche for her wickedness. I'm too numb to believe the doll. The horror of her words divides at the top of my skull and drips down each side, falling away from me. I listen like I'm dreaming, and the dream is a nightmare, but nothing that can truly hurt me once I wake. Thank you. Hi, that was wonderful, Mona. Thank you so much for that reading. Um, my name is Leanne Cal. I'm a fiction writer and a poet, uh, Choctaw from Oklahoma. I'm gonna read today from 1918 Union Valley Road. Uh, this is the story of my grandmother in 1918 during the, the flu pandemic. Uh, in which both of them caught the flu and um, her husband dies. So um, this is told uh, and, and in poetry. So I'll begin. 1918 Union Valley Road, Oklahoma. Maybe it was while reading the 1918 Union Valley Bulletin a political handbill given John Hoggett by a hacking coffer at the feed store. <clears throat> Maybe it was the sour apple gone mahogany black that he'd eaten from his wife's cellar stash. He knew he should have given it to, the, to their hog Trudy. Or maybe it was the six mile walk to and from his father's farm in Stonewall, Oklahoma, just to ask, need any help with that heifer pop? Maybe it was the burning, tingling, running over the top of John's head as if he was being roasted alive, filling him with fear. He coughed into his fist, no. Iva, honey, lock the gate so the Crowder boys can't steal our cow. He coughed into his fist. No, 
Iva, honey, he coughed into his fist. Iva, so cold. Words like, winds like a siren whipped the junipers outside, maybe 90 per. He swayed left and then right and onto their Jenny Lynn bed, a wedding gift, cover, coveralls still on. Shocked into consciousness by sunlight, Iva supports herself with her arms and leans forward, eyelids thick and, and gluey. Has she been crying in her sleep? The bed is cold, the stove is out, her long black hair matted by high fevers. In her dreams, the sound of a gurgling brook. She looks at John. Her teeth chatter. He is completely blue now. She presses on John's chest. Blood and mucus slip between his blue lips. Breathe, John. Breathe. Don't worry. I gave our baby to your sister, Yuda, yesterday, the day before, maybe last week. But she's safe now. Didn't make a sound. Just waved bye-bye. Bye-bye, Mommy. Like you, she doesn't complain. Like you, she's more Irish than Cherokee like me. Breathe, John. Breathe. Take a breath, John Hoggett. How many times? Breathe. Iva curls by his side, played out. Who has never bruised a living flower, she whispers. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to take. If I should die before I wake. Breathe, John. Breathe. The sun is yet a rumor. Iva sleeps like the dead until she doesn't. On the third day, she feels herself rising. She observes herself in the mirror, washes her mahogany cheeks. That's odd, she thinks. Lock the gate, lock the gate, John, or the Crowder boys will steal our cow. She coughs into her handkerchief. John, honey, she coughs into her handkerchief. John, honey, she coughs into her handkerchief. Hear me? Yes, Iva. You live in unmeaning dreams, he says. The grave is ready. John, honey, stay. I washed your Sunday shirt, hung it on the line to dry. We can bury our faces in summer laundry, taste the scent of sun in a field of light, breathing as one, stay. Iva is dreaming again. She hears his name, John. The sound like a bell on her tongue, John, on, 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 gone, breathe. Iva forgets to die. Give me your hand, John Hoggett. Remember our fishing hole at Bing, fed from an underground spring? Gorgeous switch canes at the blue water's edge. Make the finest Cherokee baskets. Remember, give me your hand, John. Together we'll catch a mess of perch, cut the canes and load the wagon. We'll have our folks over for supper. Just half a day's wagon ride away, not far. Give me your hand, dearest. Just last fall, we helped build the Bing P.O., named in honor of Sir John Julian Bing, a British war hero. 
Your father had a conniption. What's an Irishman doing putting an Englishman forward? Give me your hand, John. I call you home now. I call you home tomorrow. A thousand times as our bodies flake into stars. Get up, John Hoggett. Get up. You can't stay in this deathbed. Walk on, Iva, says John softly. Walk on, my girl. My girl. My. No, it wasn't like that. You didn't see. He was lying quietly, mouth shut, one hand on his chest, the other frozen in mid-stir. We were curled beside one another when they found us. Beside, what a wonderful word. Beside is the scent I carry. Beside the first man I touched and his touching me. Beside him when I was raised from the dead, fully awake, I heard something. Perhaps our baby, a kitten crying for a saucer of milk, a kitten crying because she is lost, because she is forsaken, because she is left alive. No, not the cat, me. Thank you. Jeez, gonna jeez, it's really a pleasure to be part of this. My name's Ernestine Hayes, and I belong to the Wolf House of the Kogwan Ton clan of the Eagle Side of the Tlingit Nation. My Tlingit name is Sankatlakt. I have three children, four grandchildren, and three great grandchildren. I live in Juneau, Alaska, not far from the Juneau Indian village where I was born. I was born at the end of the Second World War and for the first several years of my life, I lived with my grandmother in the, our old house in the village while my mother was in and out of the hospital for tuberculosis. And when I was 15, my mother and I moved to California where I stayed for 25 long years and I never came home, not once, but not a day went by that I didn't long for home. Finally, when I turned 40, my children grown or living with their father, homeless, not for the first time, broke, not for the last time, my life in shambles. I said, let me go home or let me die with my thoughts facing north. It took me eight months to get from San Francisco to Ketchikan, living in my car, sleeping in shelters, standing in food lines. And when I got to Ketchikan, I camped out from May to October. And then I found a job, found a place to stay, sent for my mother and sent for my sons. And two years later, we made it all the way back home to Juneau. And I know I love it more than if I'd never left. So my first book, Blonde Indian, tells the story of that return, as well as the story of the return of the seasons, the return of the salmon, return of the bear. And today I'll be reading from work in progress. And first I'll quickly recap the uh, story of the woman who married a bear. This story is told all over the world, wherever bears have lived. And this is, uh, 
short paragraph is from my book, Blonde Indian. Long ago, a woman went into the forest and found herself alone there. She slipped on a pile of bear dung and spilled her berries. She cursed the bear that had made her slip and fall. But the bear heard her and came to her as a man. And they married and had children. And those children became our cousins. That woman stayed gone from her own people for a long time. And when the woman finally came back home, she was a stranger. So my work in progress um, also refers to beings who live in what I call the spoken forest. And that concept is cited in a poem of mine that's installed at Totem Bite in Ketchikan. And that goes, I was thinking about the forest one day and it came to me. Our stories, our songs, our names, our history, our memories are not lost. All these riches are being kept for us by our aunties, our uncles, our grandparents, our relatives, those namesakes who walk and dance wearing robes that make them seem like bears and wolves, our loved ones, those beings who live in the spoken forest. They're holding everything for us. So I'm working on weaving three narrative voices, and the first of which is the woman who married a bear. And in addition to her own story and that of her husband, she carries the stories of the other beings who live there in the spoken forest where she also lives. So this is her voice. When I was still young enough to think that never is a word, the unyielding future approached me like a bear walking on two legs, ominous, haunting, sad. My irresponsible heart left with him and I followed. Each summer our family gladly returned to a worn trail on a tall mountain to find our favorite berries. We licked from our hands the juicy tart hope of baskets full of ripened life. Along the trail in awakened light and awakening shadows, we boasted and teased and called out our various dreams. We measured our distance from one another by those calls, sons, daughters, eager grandchildren, and melancholy elders whose roomy eyes reflected images of always one more child running up a trail to test precocious summer berries, always one more almost woman drawn forward by the unyielding embrace of a future walking toward her on two legs. That tall mountain held our village in its hands. It brought midsummer rains, its trails uncovered berries and greens and game. But as I followed that man who walked on four legs, that bear who walked on two, I saw that what I had thought was a mountain was only a log. And what I thought were logs on a mountain were no more than cedar embers glowing in a bundled fire. We greeted yesterday's smokehouses, now watched by haunted rivers. We chased nested godwits. We followed the trails of runaway boys. Backs bent, we scrambled across low bush willow and walked along riverbed and shore through every timbered edge of alpine tundra. I began to love the twilight. I already loved the man. I counted the changes come over me. I admired my forelimb claws. Newly uncovered beetle grub delighted me. Soft flesh, thick, wormy savor. Who knows how many steps we took before we reached his village? Who knows how long we stayed? After a while, we left. We found a hermit's mountain and made our home at the frayed hem of time, at a place between worlds where now thin forest meets waiting snow-covered rock. The second voice that I'm hoping to weave is meant to represent an uncolonized modern woman who is living between the forest and town. And this is her voice. 
Every day I return to that twilight morning when I sensed a cool touch at the back of my neck. I thought perhaps my collar had fallen, my shape had shifted, perhaps my skin had slipped. Between the back edges of my mask, I touched then and reach again now for the phantom dazzling void, the horror of emptiness, the fear of my own not being. I live in a space between light and shadow. I live in the space between shadow and light. I continue to love twilight dawn and hesitant dusk. I live mid-mountain. I've heard it said that when Hanshan lived among mountains, he welcomed warm rain and breathed cold air. I have heard it said that when Li Po became drunk from wine and friendship, he sucked coarse dregs and praised bitter drink. I bequeath the remnants of my common life. I arrange a deathbed to fill my gaze with one last glimpse of home. Fat days and short nights, these are the ways I age. Thoughts walk beside me like a bear on two legs, ominous, haunting, sad. The third voice, this last one, is that of a woman who appears in Blonde Indian. She knows old Tom and she knew young Tom, as well as at least one other who now lives in the spoken forest. She rep represents a colonized life and this is, this is her voice. Side sleeve red dress off the shoulder, off the chart, off the rocks, black fedora tipped to side eyed gaze that kept the cue ball hot. When that Virgo man took his corner shot, this jukebox honky tonk woman hit the floor. The one thing I ever knew about men was that I sure wanted one to love me. I wanted every man I ever saw to want me back. When my mother asked the only man she ever loved if he wanted to see the new baby, I wanted them all to say yes. So my taste in men was already bad when I happened on a pick of what must have been the man who was my father, the man who sent me from a newborn sidewalk through decades of chasing his miscarried love, only to find he looked just a bit slimy, just a bit condescending, just a bit smug, just a bit like a love it turned out I never wanted after all. Honky tonk woman, no doubt, but I can only do one thing on one day. And today that one thing is to remember that red dress, that dance floor and that dance. Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. Are we all unmuted? Uh, Leanne, I think you're still muted. Leanne, you're still muted. There you are. How about now? Yes, we're all here. Am I unmuted? Yes. <laughs> I'm telling other people and I am like, oh my gosh, it was such a pleasure to, to uh, listen to you. And I want to thank um, Annette and Lourdes and all the people at Box Femme for giving us this wonderful platform. Um, this is really a joy. And um, you are two of my favorite all-time favorite authors. And, um, and I had a question that popped up right away. It's one that writers are asked all the time, but I really actually do want to ask you this. It's not just, I'm not just throwing it out because it's, it's, and it has to do with process and inspiration and what launches your next new piece. And I know I'll, I'll answer for me. I feel like I don't choose my, my, my subjects, my, whatever I'm going to be writing that I feel tapped. Um, and I thought it was interesting that I was working on, on a, a novel um, that had nothing to do with Indian boarding school. And then in February, it's like something tapped me and said, no, you have to write this novel now that's inspired by your family um, and their experiences over generations in Indian boarding school. And so I dropped everything. I wrote that, finished it at the end of May. And then a week after I finished it, all of the, the horror stories started coming out. Um, where they're finding these mass graves of, of children who, who were who died, were killed, who knows what happened in these 
um, Indian residential schools, Catholic ones in Canada. And of course we lost so many children here in the United States that way. And so it felt like the ancestors were like, no, we want to focus on this story. And then Leanne, I know you started your, your 1918 book before the pandemic we're all going through and Ernestine. So I want to hear, like, I, I would love to hear if, if you don't mind, um, how you feel it works for you. Um, well, my my um, mine has a, a, a sort of a, a very um, similar tone to it, and I was working on it as you were, you know, before all all this finally revealed itself. And in in mine, the woman who married a bear and lives in the forest um, carries stories of the other beings who live in the forest. Um, and some of the beings who live in the forest are runaway boys who ran away from residential schools, mm. never made it home, and were never found, and they are believed to still be running. There are, you catch glimpses of them, um, people who live near where they where they ran away from, see them, leave food on the, on, the, on the porch for them. And I believe, or part of their function in my writing, the runaway boys represent modern indigenous men who were never allowed to, to become men because of the Western um, value system. And so mm -hmm. they continue to run as boys and they never, never reach their fullness because of that. So I think that that also like yours was something we're guided to do as writers. Oh, wow. I, I, it's so powerful. It's just, I'm just getting, I get goosebumps, you know, so thank you. Ms. Leanne? Um, oh, I was just, I was enthralled by what you were saying, Ernestine. Um, and, and I want to also uh, say again how much I uh, am, am grateful to reading with both of you. Um, it was, the readings were beautiful. I just really fell into both of your readings and I wanted to, well, keep reading. I want to know more. And uh, so my work, um, this, this piece is re was really odd for me because I knew about my grand grandmother. I knew she had married an Irishman um, who, whose family was living in and around Ada at Stonewall. I knew that. I didn't know exactly. There were so many things I didn't know that this writing, this piece about her, has revealed she always had scars on both cheeks and they were slight but by the time I came along they were very uh, they weren't as black as they were uh, and she used a little makeup to to cover them up those were uh, 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 famine scars um, from being hungry you're it can and and um, um, not just hungry, but also um, kind of starvation. So they went through that and because they were in a Stonewall in a house and it was closed and no one was taking care of them. So there were, she was deprived, her body was deprived of oxygen mm. and it scarred her face. It scars anybody's face that's been living on low oxygen. And I didn't know that. You know, I really didn't know where they came from. I never thought to ask. I don't, uh, I was a little kid, just my grandma, don't ask. Right. <laughs> but there were many, there's been many things. I didn't exactly know how, how long John Hoggett lived and I had to look that up. So um, what happened, uh, he, he gets buried and she, the, just the story of her and the research I've done, she goes to, uh, bec she becomes a housekeeper for her great uncle. And he paid her 50 cents a week for her to live and take care of them and cook for them. And um, so that's how she supported herself 
and her daughter um, for at least three years as a housekeeper. And so I, I had to think, well, what on earth were they doing um, during the 1918 flu? Mm -hmm. And um, so there are all these pictures of her uh, in, in black, in a black dress. It's not always the same dress, but it's always black. And she's very young. And I thought, oh, and she never told us either. Um, those were her clothes from the pandemic that, you know, she went to so many funerals, she dyed her clothes black. So mm -hmm. that's what she was wearing. And all of these things, you know, she passed away, um, in 1987 and um, all these things that I knew about her, I've just begun to put together to understand what her life was about. And it's, it's, uh, it's revealing to me, it is, it is, a lot of it is sad and, um, uh, so it's it's taught me a lot about about her that I just didn't know, although I had all the clues. You know. Yeah, I that that detail about the dress. Um, I remember you telling me that um, before today, and that was just it's those details when we figure them out, um, it becomes a whole story in and of itself. Right. Um, right. And. And, and please feel free to, to jump in with your own questions. I, I just had, I had one more question um, and it had to do with what you hope to accomplish with your writing. Um, and I know for me, uh, especially with this Council of Dolls book that I wrote, which um, it covers three generations of my family and it is fictional, but it's very much inspired by many actual events. And my grandmother went to Carlisle, my mom who went to different Indian boarding schools in her generation and then my generation. Um, and I felt when I was writing it that there was healing work going on across these generations that I was being so guided by family um, that has long passed away. Even it felt like I was healing some of their rifts with each other. I would just find I was crying as I was writing and, and um, and so I came to realize that really, if I look at the work that I've, I've been writing, um, it's all about healing. So yes, I'll take readers through shadows, through the difficult times, through dark times, but I don't wanna leave them there. Um, there's always this um, optimism and this, this hope that yes, these terrible things happened, but healing is possible, but not for me, it's never by hiding the truth or hiding what happened under a carpet that the wounds just fester when you do that. Um, and then the next generation is born and has to carry that. And then the next generation has to carry that too until they're all, you know, like um, I'll talk about infantry troops and they're humping, they're humping all this stuff on their back carrying. And, and so it's like, I'm trying to help people dismantle, dismantle all of that. But I'd love to know what what you feel about what you're doing with your writing or what you're hoping to do with your writing. I'm hoping to complete the, what I hope will become a trilogy. You know, I'm 76 years old and I, you know, I've, I've, I've got to measure um, my time when I get into a position. I'm still having, I still don't have a house to live in, but I'm hoping to be, to be situated soon to where I can at least finish this one next book. And um, I want to complete the trilogy. I want to tell those stories. And while you were talking, it made me remember that in addition to the runaway boys representing today's modern indigenous men who are prevented from becoming full men, um, there's a crying woman also in the forest and she appears in Blonde Indian, but it's this old story of a woman crying in the forest 
And my grandmother used to tell it to me and tell me that if I heard a woman crying in the forest at night, if I removed my clothes and followed her, the sound of her voice, I would find her and she would be holding her baby. And if I grabbed her baby, then she would give me anything to have her baby back. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the ways to become rich and wealthy and fortunate at, in the forest. Um, and in, in my understanding now, she represents today's indigenous people that she's lost everything. She's lost her belongings. She's lost her language. She's lost her history. She's willing to give all that up for one thing, and that is the next generation, mm. right? And that's our culture today, isn't it? We, are, we have lost everything. We're willing to live as well as we can because we want to save one thing, and that's the next generation. So that's what I'm hoping we'll all do. Mm -hmm. Oof. Well, thank that's you. So powerful, Ernestine. And, and somehow we know it in our bones. That's, that's, and, and, and I kind of feel like that's what our grandmothers taught us for the next generation, not just for you, but for what comes after. And so our stories, though, I, I think we're telling, I know with, I, I can say with this book, I'm telling this story of, of uh, the flu. I'm telling this story of hunger, of what happened and how did they live through it? So if I can just do that thing, that one thing, then I'm hoping that it will be a light to, for others to follow. We can survive this. And the book came along and then the pandemic came along and uh, Granny survived mm -hmm. and I can survive and I can help other people survive. But I guess, that's kind of what we're all doing. I know that's what I felt about uh, your Council of Dolls. I, did I get that title mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Council of Dolls, I love that. That they're trying to, to, they're trying to save everybody. And in that process, they save themselves. And that is, that's, that's such a powerful story. That's so powerful that we we can try and pass on this chant of healing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I I have another question, but again, you guys could just feel free to. I don't mean to be so bossy. I'm the young one here, and I'm being all bossy. Um, but one thing that I, I was thinking about, and one thing I'm so happy about, is this more and more native uh, indigenous voices being um, published all, all of a sudden. I mean, you know, we're still just a teeny little drop in the bucket when it comes to all of the books that are out there in the world, but it's starting and especially more children's books because I love to read. I grew up in a family of readers, but there were, I never saw my experience anywhere, anywhere, anywhere um, in anything I read or, or on television, et cetera, et cetera. And so I was just curious about what it was like for you trying, you know, being people who are readers with, yeah, you know, what did you make of what was out there in the world for you when you were coming up, when you were kids? Because um, I'm sure, you know, you're, you're, you've had the same exact experience I did as far as that. My experience was a little different. Obviously, I'm about two generations before you, and I grew up in a territory. It wasn't even a state. And yeah. Everything that came to Alaska was months behind everything else. But I certainly received messages, the message from um, movies and songs and magazines and textbooks and children's books and people I saw on the street and court systems and teachers teachers and preachers, I received the message that um, I wasn't good enough, I would never be like them, I would never 
I would never meet their standards of beauty. I wouldn't be smart like them. I'd be just like there was, they showed me a world that was impossible for me to attain. And that's the message I got. So I join you in the appreciation for books now that tell the truth, that allow children to see themselves, not someone they will never be, but themselves and to see the, the, the worth and the beauty in themselves and their family and the people who are reading to them. Yes. I, I, my funny story, it's not funny, but it is now. My, um, I, we had career days and all that kind of thing. And I think I'm in the seventh or eighth grade and, um, the counselor, we all go to the counselor, right? Because we have to choose what we're going to do in school in the ninth grade, I think. I was in the eighth grade. And I said, oh, you know, I, I want to be a musician and I want to be this and I want to write. And um, she said, oh, honey, the best you're ever going to be is you could be a teacher's aide, you know? I think that's, that's, that's what I would aim for, mm -hmm. being a teacher's aide. Mm -hmm. And I was just crushed by that thinking, well, okay, that's the best I'm gonna do, damn you. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say that, of course. <laughs> but, it, you know, it was like, you know, uh, give up. And so I, maybe it was really good because it made me so mad um, that I that I vowed, I, you know, to do something else. But those were, yeah, those were the days, no books. Um, but I had, I did have my grandmother, the one I'm writing about now, who, who was a storyteller. So she was kind of my book. And I'd go spend time with her and I'd get all these stories. And so um, there is that. Yeah, are the, these grandmothers, um, these elders, they're like our, our, our world book encyclopedia set. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know? And just incredible resources. And uh, yeah, I grew up with all these stories that like the counter narrative. Um, right. My parents were definitely always giving me that counter narrative to what I was going to be learning in school. And I'm just so grateful that, um, that the two of you, despite all of that crushing, um, those crushing messages that were coming in at you. And I had, even though I, I had a luckier path in many ways, but I got a lot of that too. Um, and just that you, that you just went and, and transcended that, that you blazed the trails, that you um, you know, that you just accomplished so much and, and now have, are giving us um, all of these amazing books to read and for others to, to be inspired by and to help, yeah, to help, yeah, new generations coming up. So we've all been interviewed before and sometimes I'll, it's all I can do not to roll my eyes at some of the questions. I'm like, oh gosh. And there are things they never ask me. So I'm wondering if there's anything you've never been asked in an interview that you just wish someone would ask you, something that is so important to who you are and to what you do, but that they just seem to have no idea. And of course, I'm talking about the mainstream, you know, all the, the you know, different radio programs or the different um, on, journalists uh, online or, or uh, paper uh, interviews and, some of them are wonderful. Some of them are just like, oh my God, you feel like you're just giving them this cor crash course on native history. And, you know, that's not my job to do as, as, a, as an artist. So I'm just curious if you. Even though um, one of the first questions I was ever asked with Blonde Indian is, where did you get that title? And that um, is explained in the first two sentences. So I knew, I knew, I knew where this was going to go. But um, I would far rather be asked questions that I've been asked before that I'm prepared to, to you know, to go ahead and wrote out. Um, then some of the as some of the unexpected off the wall, where did you get that kind of questions that like, I don't even know where you got that. So um, 
I think the question that I most appreciate is, do you have any last words? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> last words. <laughs> Honestly, I think um, uh, this, is, this was an audience question, which I, I've told Mona many times. Do Choctaws keep cats? <laughs> <laughs> Where is that coming from? What? what? You know, and I said, yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> I have That's to say, amazing. I've been learning. I've learned finally how to take over an interview uh, in a subtle way when I just don't want to be taken far off into whatever they're interested in. And I just smile and nod and then just talk about something completely <laughs> So, well, we've had um, this lovely hour together and unless anybody want, has something else that you'd love to, to talk about, um, I, I guess we're reaching probably most people and watching videos and hours about is about a good time. So we could probably close here unless anyone has any last words. <laughs> I would like to um, make one point be um, yes. before um, we pass it around. And that is when the crying woman, when uh, uh, Leanne was talking after I said that and we were talking about it, I realized that um, we were once that baby in her arms. We were once the baby in the arms of the crying woman, and now we're the crying women. Now we're the <laughs> ones who are who are reaching for the baby. And my last words are always decolonize, <laughs> undo capitalism, mm. smash the patriarchy, resist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We needed that. <laughs> I think that says it all right there. there. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> thank you. Thank you both so much for joining me here. And thank you to Vox Fem so much for giving yes, us. Yes, thank that you. One. Gonna change you. seeing your faces. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>